Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Ken Serberg. I am a business consultant with the Small Business Development Center located in this building on the first floor. And we'd like to welcome you to Y Export to the Czech Republic and Central Europe. <clears throat> this is a program in conjunction with Global Entrepreneurship Week, which is something the Small Business Development Center has been involved with over the past several years. And I'm happy to announce that we have Mr. Josh Kaplan here speaking today. Uh, Josh is the Office Director of the U.S. Commercial Service Kansas City Field Office. In this capacity, Josh will lead a team of international trade specialists responsible for working with the business community in eastern Kansas and western Missouri to increase sales and markets around the world. Josh has spent the last eight years working with this agency, and prior to his time in Kansas City, he served six years in central Virginia advising urban and rural businesses in a variety of industries on best practices for achieving international sales objectives. Prior to his work with the U.S. Commercial Service, Joshua held a variety of positions related to international trade, including managing foreign assistance programs, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and leading trade remedy investigations at the U.S. International Trade Commission. Joshua has a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Kansas, the master's degree in international trade policy from George Washington University. Joshua resides in Kansas City, Missouri with his wife and two children. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Joshua Kaplan to Missouri Southern. Thanks again. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. All right. So as uh, I'd like to first of all I'd like to thank Ken and Lisa and Dr. Stebbins uh, for, for sort of inviting me and including me in this presentation. This is my first time at Missouri Southern. I always like to visit universities and meet the students. Uh, it's so energizing to see you all kind of your interest in this field. And I, it sort of takes me back a bit to my time when I was in your shoes. And it, it's, it's a really exciting field to work in and to talk about. I'll go into that a bit later. But uh, yeah, without further ado, let's kind of get to it. So I always think it's important at the beginning of a presentation for the audience to get to know the speaker a little bit. Uh, so some of this was covered uh, in Ken's introduction, but really kind of I like to point out. So here's our, I don't know if we have any Chiefs fans in the audience, but here's our, our team in Kansas City in front of Union Station. Uh, back when the Chiefs were kind of in the playoffs or the Super Bowl, they always deck it out. But something that last bullet point here is, is really something I like to, to mention that was really instructive for me, formative for me when I was in school was uh, was doing study abroad. Uh, I know you all have that opportunity here at Missouri Southern, I believe. Definitely something I'd recommend if you can consider it because funnily enough, and, and you might say, well, no one knows what they're going to do when they get out of college. No one knows what they're going to do 20 years down the road. But as it turned out, when I did a study abroad experience in Mexico, right after my time at KU, I did an internship for an agency, which is the same agency where I now work. And, and sometimes I work with the same people that I did at that time as an intern. So, you know, I've had some sort of different roles in between that time, but it really put me on the path that I'm on today. And I was so fortunate to have that experience. I encourage you all to do that if you have the time. Uh, and, and I also would like to say, if you all want to ask questions during the presentation, I welcome it. You can just raise your hand. I'm so glad that we have in-person hands and not Zoom hands here uh, to make this a bit more engaging. So I'm actually going to give somewhat of a two part presentation. I know the topic of this presentation is focused on sort of doing business with the Czech Republic, and I think it's so wonderful that you all have that theme semester focused on that region this year. Uh, so I'm going to cover that. Before I do that, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the US Commercial Service, just so you all can kind of see what our agency is about and, and, and sort of see how we come into the picture. And then the second part of the presentation is really to talk a bit more about what it's like to work in this field. I talk with Ken and others, and it seems like that's something that's of interest. I don't know, can we get a show of hands? How many of you are uh, juniors, seniors? Senior, okay, got a couple seniors back there. Okay, freshmen? All right, okay, so you've still got a bit of time to figure it out. It's just to say that I wanna talk a little bit about what it's like to work in this field, give some examples of some projects that I've worked on, and then maybe just provide some food for thought for you all as you're considering kind of where you want to go from here. You have a lot of options. I just want to kind of provide the information. And then definitely time at the end for a question and answer. So U.S. Commercial Service, here's our mission on here. I'm not going to read through the slide. Uh, I'm going to try really hard throughout this presentation not to read off the slides. But they're really, you can see there in the bold, when you talk about 
the U.S. government, and you talk about ways to support business growth, and you talk about exporting, that's really our agency's focus just about 100% of the time. How can we work with businesses to help them find their national customers one project at a time, one event at a time, locally? So you see here just a few kind of key points. Because we are the U.S. government, when we meet on, when we talk about projects overseas, uh, we meet with foreign governments, we can advocate for U.S. businesses and we do it every day around the world. That next kind of leads me to my next point about the, uh, our global network. So our agency, we have offices across the U.S., but we actually also have them around the world. It's over 75 countries. So if you go to a country, you go to the Czech Republic, in fact, and you go to the U.S. Embassy in Prague, and there will be a commercial section of that embassy. And that is staffed by a U.S. diplomat and by Czech nationals whose sole focus is on supporting U.S. business growth. And so that's our agency. And then that last point is really just talking about being results driven. We're, we want to measure our results. We're taxpayer funded. We want to show how we're supporting U.S. businesses. So that's very important to us. And this slide, again, I'm not going to read through it, but this is just really showing kind of a few examples of how we work with businesses. So that first bullet here, export counseling, meeting with companies, talking with them about how they export, working with a group like an SBDC or a state, uh, I have some colleagues here from the state of Missouri with the state government, formulating a plan with a local business on how they're going to conduct their export sales. So we provide expertise in that regard. We also work to provide market research to businesses as well. If they're interested in a country or a market like the Czech Republic, uh, they may have a hard time coming up with information on their own. They may not have access to databases. They certainly don't have staff typically in that country who can talk to them about that market. And so that's a service that we can provide. And that third bullet, we're talking about business matchmaking. That's really how we spend most of our time working with the U.S. business, working with a company in Joplin. They've identified a market. They don't know maybe who their partners are going to be on the ground. Typically, a U.S. company is not going to just sell to end users uh, in a foreign country. Maybe some consumer goods. There are a few examples, but a lot of the time they're working through a local company. So in this case, a Czech company would partner with a U.S. company and sell their, their goods or services on the ground there. And so we facilitate that by, by coming up with lists of potential partners, going with the U.S. companies to that market to support their meetings and to help ensure their success. This is sort of the last slide talking about our agency in this way. Uh, I also have on here our, our state and local partnerships. So we have the, I'd like to just kind of mention Olivia and Stefan here from the Missouri Department of Economic Development here as well, uh, based in Springfield. And, but we also have partners from the World Trade Centers and from the SPDCs. You can see here on the bottom, that's our slide for our office is uh, myself and then my colleagues, Pinky and Fernando. And together we support our office territory uh, as was mentioned. So with that introduction, I wanna just kind of provide a few points that might be of, of interest to you all when thinking about the Czech Republic thinking about maybe how it relates to other markets. Uh, how does it compare? Now, I will, I will have sort of a big preface and caveat to say, I'm not an expert on the Czech Republic. Uh, I have not even been there, but we do have access to resources, just like we would working with the US company. We have access to resources to help make informed decisions. And so I wanna go through sort of some key statistics and facts that will kind of help you all understand uh, how does the Czech Republic compare to other countries in terms of its size, what are its main areas of uh, international trade? And, and, and so then we're gonna talk a little bit about how the US and the Czech Republic do business together, and then provide a bit of information about Missouri specifically and trade with that market. So when you're talking about Europe, I'm sure you all probably covered this in your coursework. When you're talking about Europe, you definitely have to look at the EU and, and how that sort of influenced the relationship between European countries. So you can see here, of course, the Czech Republic is part of the EU. And you can see here the sort of timeline. I should say some of these slides are actually provided by the Czech government. So they're, you know, they're pretty informed. Uh, they joined the EU just about 20 years ago. And, you know, they actually joined something called the Schengen area. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that. But that allows for visa fee travel within, uh, within the EU. They joined that a few years later. And, and so because the Czech Republic is now in the EU in part, you'll see on these following slides how much of their trade is sort of influenced by that. 
something else you might not note, I don't know if this was covered in your semester, the Czech Republic, as it happens, currently has the presidency of the EU uh, so that it rotates around the different member countries. And then they help to sort of lead the decision-making process when they're talking about Europe-wide decisions. They, of course, also have their own presidents and governments, but it is an important distinction to make. So, oh, you can't actually read this slide. Some of these next few slides have quite a bit of text on them. I certainly don't necessarily expect you to be able to read it all, but this is just sort of to give you an idea of where the Czech Republic kind of stands. I'm guessing you all learned about GDP in some of your, your coursework. Maybe you took an economics class or an international business class. This slide is talking about uh, GDP essentially per, per person. Put very simplistically, it's the amount of money, I suppose, the average person takes in a year in that market. That's not actually exactly what it means, but that's sort of a rough approximation. So you can see here, and I'll use the laser pointer, you've got some of these first few markets, you know, not unsurprisingly, you've got Qatar, you've got Macau, you've got Luxembourg. These are very, per person, these are very wealthy countries, very successful. You kind of go down the list, you see the United States, number 11. That's about 65,000 a year. And this is 2019, so just a couple of years old. Once you start going down from the United States, you start seeing Western European countries on here, Denmark, Germany. Uh, you see a few others, you've got Belgium, Finland. Once you start getting past Western Europe, then you start seeing Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Here's a Czech Republic, number 40. So, you know, a relatively successful, prosperous country, maybe a little less so on average than some parts of Western Europe, but also ahead of some parts of Eastern Europe, like Poland, a uh, lot, you have, uh, let's see here, I saw some other, Romania, Croatia, Czech Republic GDP per capita 2019 is right around $40,000. That's compared to 65,000 in the US. Uh, so just to give kind of a frame of reference, it's important to think about when you're looking at the economy of a country, how they stand. This is just one measure, but it is one that people often refer to. Now, here's another slide with a lot of text. I'm so glad we have this big screen so you can sort of read it. Uh, but we have here, this is who the Czech Republic exported to in 2020. Uh, and you can see here, the interesting thing about this slide is that all of the top 10 countries are all in Europe. And so that sort of dates back to my kind of earlier point about the EU and how closely EU countries are integrated with each other in terms of their trade. Now, if you go to number, I believe it's number 11, you have here the United States uh, as the leading trading, the leading export destination for Czech goods and services outside of Europe. So that's significant. That means that the United States is actually a pretty important market for the Czech economy. Although, if you look at it at a dollar value, you got 62 billion in sales to Germany. In the US, you only have 4 billion. So relatively speaking, it's still, it's still pretty low. Next slide here is talking about imports. So I'm sure when you're learning about international business, you're learning about exports and imports, right? So when you look at the import side of things for the Czech Republic, you have, uh, similarly, you have a lot of trade with Europe and the United States. You know, the one sort of outlier in some ways is China, $30 billion in imports. But of course, a lot of, a lot of countries, including the United States, have China as one of their main suppliers. I think you'll see some of these later slides. A lot of these imports are probably going right back into the Czech economy and turning into exports. A lot of intermediate goods, a lot of equipment for machinery that's being made in the Czech Republic. Uh, also, I'm sure a lot of consumer goods. So that's sort of interesting to point out. And that's, that's sort of what these next slides are mentioning. So what is the Czech Republic importing and exporting? It's mostly electronic equipment and machinery and vehicles. They're uh, being imported as well as fuel. So the Czech Republic, I'm not sure to what extent you say this, but of course it's an industrialized economy. They have a lot of manufacturing. Uh, so they're gonna need all of these goods to be able to manufacture their different goods and serve their different products. So, with this next slide, I'm kind of, and I'm kind of going through this a little bit because I do want to have time at the end for a Q&A, but this next slide is really talking about kind of national level trade between the U.S. and the Czech Republic. And this is always important to look at the date. So this is 2021. So this is just a bit more recent. It's during COVID, sort of the kind of later part of COVID. If you see trade data, 
and it's in 2020, you have to really be careful if you see that because a lot of those numbers are going to be skewed by the change in the economy due to COVID. But you see here, U.S. exports to Czech Republic, $5 billion. Imports from Czech Republic, $7.5 billion. So there is a bit of a trade deficit for the U.S. with Czech Republic, but it's, it's somewhat, somewhat even in terms of the scale. An interesting thing to note, so for U.S. goods, you know, I mentioned the U.S. is, I believe, the, on that chart before, the 11th biggest market for the Czech Republic to send their goods to. If you look at it from the other perspective, the U.S. is, or I'm sorry, Czech Republic is the 50th largest export market for U.S. goods. So it's relatively small. When you're talking about markets that U.S. companies are exporting to, the Czech Republic, there are 49 other countries that the U.S. exports more products to than the Czech Republic. So that's important to note. And so that's, that's less than half of a percent of the U.S. sort of export market. Pretty similar on the import side. The U.S. isn't importing a whole lot from the Czech Republic relative to other countries. You're going to see a little bit kind of here, but when something interesting about the Czech Republic, and I kind of saw this a little bit in my research, that actually a lot of their power is from nuclear power. I think they have, I want to say like six, five or six nuclear plants supplying a pretty good portion of their electricity. And the United States actually has a pretty robust nuclear sort of an industry that supplies nuclear plants around the world. And so a lot of the trade that you're going to see between these two countries is actually equipment for nuclear power plants and sort of related machinery. Now, that's pretty expensive equipment. So I, I would venture to guess, and I think we may see it on the next slide here. No, uh, I would venture to guess that of that, you know, five billion or so, a fair amount of that is probably related to the nuclear industry because that, that's all expensive equipment. It's also similar when you look at like aerospace exports. That's such a big portion of the U.S. export economy because you know, it's pretty expensive to buy an airplane, and that's somewhere where the U.S. a bit of a, a bit of a tangent, but. You have to look at the value of the goods that are being traded and that can help dictate kind of how important the trading relationship is. It's much more uh, expensive to export a piece of a nuclear plant than it is a bag of grain. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Kind of going through here. So now we've kind of taken it. We looked at sort of the, the Czech Republic perspective, kind of the EU level. We looked at the US level, the national level in terms of trade. And now we just have a couple slides. I'd like to thank Olivia for kind of helping to put this information together. Slides about Missouri's trade with the Czech Republic. So this chart is really showing exports, right? It's showing exports to the Czech Republic the last five years. Now we're at about 23 million in the most recent year of items being exported from Missouri to the Czech Republic. You can actually, I don't know how many of you like to play around with trade data if you've gotten into that all of your coursework, but all of this information is, is free and publicly accessible. So you can go on my agency's website or, or I guess the International Trade Administration website and you can do a query and you can generate these graphs really easily between Missouri or between the US and just about any other country. And you can see the trade data yourself. So that's pretty interesting. It's definitely something you all can utilize for your cor coursework. So you'll see here, it's been pretty steady, right around 20 million for the last uh, 20 or last five years. But this, and this slide is breaking down. Okay, well, what are we exporting? This blue, $4 million, that's, yeah, that's plastics. Oh. Uh, that's plastics. And then you see here the orange, that's other machinery. And the gray is also machinery. So at least half the exports going from Missouri to the Czech Republic in 2021 were sort of related to kind of equipment and machinery and plastics. It makes sense, they're an industrialized economy, they have a lot of manufacturing. So this is supporting that. Looking at imports, so Missouri actually imports a lot more from the Czech Republic than it exports to the Czech Republic. Most recently, $71 million. See here, kind of hovering 50, 60, 70 million. Kind of similar, right? Electrical equipment, uh, motor vehicle parts. So I, I'm sure a lot of you know there's quite a big uh, automotive assembly industry in Missouri. So and that's a pretty integrated industry. So a lot of those parts from a car that you might, you know, you might buy, or that someone else in the United States might buy, that's made in Missouri. I know, for example, Kansas City has two very large automotive manufacturing plants. Some of those parts are probably coming from the Czech Republic. Some of those inputs. 
So that's sort of interesting to note as well. Now, that was sort of my kind of brief. I told you I was going to kind of fly through this because I wanted there to be time at the end. I hope you all are, are you all thinking of your questions? Anybody? Keep thinking about them, okay? Because uh, I don't want to have to call on people. <laughs> but so we have here, we have my next slide, which is this is something that's really a passion of mine. I've presented on working in international trade to a number of different student groups, universities in the Kansas City area, but also in other parts of the country, talking about what it's like to work in this field. It's really, you know, I, I think probably for a lot of you, even in, in your schooling, right, you kind of fly through it. You don't think about all the experiences you've had until you start looking at pictures, until you start remembering your different projects. And then you're, you kind of realize it, it's been a really great journey. And so for me, that's definitely true for international trade. I've really been fortunate and I want to kind of share that information because for those of you who are considering this as a career, I think it's important for you to kind of see how it all relates together for some examples, kind of where do you go next. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the International Trade Administration. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but just to give an idea of, of what our, where we fall within the federal government. And then I'm going to talk, give a few career examples, and then just share some contact info. So when I said the commercial service, so the commercial service, the agency that I work for is focused on export promotion. The commercial service is actually part of something called the International Trade Administration within the Commerce Department. And the International Trade Administration has a bit of a broader mandate. My, my job is really focused on exports, but International Trade Administration also has roles to play with regard to imports as well as with regard to policy. And so maybe I'll just read the, mi the mission just for fun. So it says, create prosperity by strengthening the international competitiveness of US industry, promoting trade and investment, and ensuring fair trade and compliance with trade laws and agreements. So that's a pretty broad mandate. I want to say the International Trade Administration has a few thousand employees. Um, most of them are in the DC area, but then you have quite a few who are like me around the US, and then you have several hundred in other countries. But that's, that's a pretty important job when you think about sort of the role of international trade. I'm sure you all learned about in your courses sort of how trade has, uh, forged stronger ties between countries, prevented wars, uh, allowed for better understanding. It's really quite important to sort of our long-term success as a nation. And, and I'm fortunate to be able to contribute to that in a very small way, a very sort of localized way. We have three business units. We've got global markets, which is where I fall. And then you have these other two, industry and analysis and enforcement and compliance. You know, we, uh, maybe we should get a bit more creative with our names, right? They're pretty, <laughs> Pretty, uh, pretty dry. But so you see here, global markets, as I mentioned, that's export promotion. Uh, we're, we're really working with small and medium sized businesses. So when myself or my staff are meeting with companies, it's usually not whatever really big company you can think of that you might know about. It's usually a lot of small businesses. So much of the US economy is small businesses. Uh, that's who we're talking to. Those are the, the companies that have been successful, maybe they're family owned. Maybe they've been around for 50 years and they've they really found their niche in the US, but they want to keep growing. And so they're looking for support to do that. So they talk to Ken or Lisa at an SBDC, talk to myself, they talk to the state colleagues, and then they put a plan in place. So that's so much of our work is working with small businesses. I really enjoy that. It's so fun to meet with companies and learn about what they've, what they've built and try to find ways to take them to the next level. If anyone is more interested in policy, and in kind of an, an economic analysis and so on. Our agency definitely, our organization has a department for that. Uh, not as much sort of public facing, not as much meeting with companies, it's much more focused on looking at information and helping the US government figure out which policies are gonna best support what is needed for our economies. And this last one is a bit different, this enforcement and compliance. So there's actually, I don't know if you all have learned about trade remedies and tariffs and so on yet in your courses. But there's a part of the Commerce Department of, of my bureau that's actually focused on there, you know, if there are goods that are deemed by US industry to maybe be unfairly competing in this market, if they're being imported in this market in a way that laws have dictated is, is not, not consistent with, with free and fair trade. There are government employees, including my colleagues, in the International Trade Administration who will actually investigate those claims. They will do a lot of data analysis, they'll use a lot of statistics. They will actually go and travel to foreign manufacturing facilities and interview those companies 
and ask them about how they've arrived at their different pricing for their products as a means to inform whether or not the U.S. government should put tariffs on those goods. Now, that seems like, okay, well, how does that relate to me? You know, is that important? Uh, these are all, so these U.S. companies that are being impacted, these are all employing, you know, hundreds or thousands of Americans. And, and a lot of them have been negatively impacted by international trade. So those need those claims need to be taken seriously and investigated. And it also affects the prices for the goods that we buy, uh, whether or not a tariff is put on something. You want to make sure that there's a tariff being put on and the prices go up, that it's consistent with with laws and regulations. Uh, this was this existed, you know, well before our recent sort of bout of inflation. But it's really important. It all adds up. So there are there are colleagues of mine who are doing that work kind of one project at a time. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about kind of my own experience working in this field, uh, talking about my own kind of day to day a little bit. So, you know, a lot of my work is, is, is outreach. So it's going out in public, it's talking to groups, it's talking to companies, learning about them and trying to find ways to, to assist more companies to export their products uh, safely and in a way that's bound for success. That's a lot of my work as a, you know, my colleague, international trade specialist is sort of the title. Uh, another way I mentioned the market research and projects. So every day, you know, this is a part that's kind of neat, especially with virtual technology. Every day I am communicating with people around the world every single day. And the same is true for my colleagues. Uh, a lot of it is via email, but now, I don't know about you all, but I was not doing like Zoom before COVID. Uh, I'm so glad that we have technology now that for international trade, to some degree, some degree it's been great for exchanging information, for getting to know colleagues. So I'm on Zoom or Teams you know, multiple times a week with colleagues working for the U.S. government in all par parts of the world, including you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, kind of remote parts of uh, you know, maybe of South America or of the Pacific. And we're all working together on projects to support a specific U.S. business. So that's really exciting and interesting to me. I know, you know, in some ways, it's like my kids will ask me, oh, what'd you do today, Dad? I call, I send some emails. And I'm like, okay, well, anybody could be doing that. But what's interesting is those emails are with people around the world and, and, and people who, are, who have had a much different sort of upbringing than I've had, much different culture, but we're all working together. So that, to me, that's pretty exciting, interesting part of our, our work. This third item here, working with partners. So part of our role, you know, we have a small office of three people in Kansas City. The other side of Missouri, I think they have four or five people. So we have, let's say, seven or eight people for our agency trying to support all of Missouri's you know, economy to help companies export more. So that's not a very big team, but in a lot of measures. So we really rely on working with partners, working with SPDC, working with state, working with city governments. Uh, sometimes those organizations have grants that they can give out to support companies' growth. Sometimes we put on events together, but we all have to collaborate. I, how many of you have ever worked on a team project before in class? I'm sure everyone has. Uh, but so we have to collaborate. We don't always have the exact same interests and our goals, ways we measure, but we have to work together. So I'm sure you've heard this from your professor and your teachers, but you really have to be able to work in a team environment. I mean, it, it's just crucial. And I, even locally, I'm not talking about working with a team from around the world on a project for a client here. You have to be able to do that too. That's not everyone has to do that, but in this field you do, but you definitely have to work on, on teams. I mean, it's my kids, you know, in, in my, my middle schooler, he has like, well, someone's not doing all the work. I'm like, well, you know, you have to be able to find a way to succeed in that environment. Even if maybe you're doing more this time, uh, it'll all kind of come back around. And, and that, that continues. I'm sure you've heard that, but that, that continues, certainly in my work. And then other projects and initiatives. I'll talk a little bit about that this in the next slide, but any job you're going to have kind of miscellaneous projects. The, the neat thing about our organization, about our work, because we are kind of pretty spread out and have a lot of different projects, you can actually work, you can kind of pick which projects you work on. You can work on a conference, you can work on a trade mission. I'm going to show some examples. You can work on an internal project. So you have to be kind of prepared to be flexible, is what I would say. So here's some nice pictures. All right. So this is a company in Virginia Beach. I want to say this is maybe 2018, you know, called Morphix Technologies. This is like pretty much most of the company, kind of their manufacturing team. And they actually make, I should have put their, their product on here, but they make, it's like an armband that police and military use and firefighters 
that will have little tabs that detect different contaminants in the air. And so if someone goes into a room and they suspect there's maybe a chemical problem or an explosive problem, uh, that tab will actually change color and the person will know whether it's safe or not to stay in there. And so this company, you know, they had had some success internationally before our agency was working with them, but they, they were looking to sell them. So what parts of the world do the, do the governments need more police equipment or more military equipment, right? There, there are certain parts where that's a really big problem, where they have terrorism threats, where they have a sort of growing, you know, growing need to keep their government employees safe. So they were looking to sell to the Middle East and North Africa. And so I actually worked with them over a couple of years on a number of different matchmaking projects. And they, they found distributors for their products, something like five or six additional countries where they hadn't been before. And, and that really put their company, their small business in Virginia Beach on the path toward continued and sustained growth. So this was actually a, a ceremony that we had, and this is their congresswoman at the time from Virginia Beach, uh, that we're just sort of recognizing that success. And they were so glad to be there uh, to kind of share that recognition. It was a lot of fun, they had a cake, it was a good time. Uh, so here I am again, I, I feel like I have to be in all these pictures. So here I am, this is actually outside of Salt Lake City. This is a delegation of foreign government officials from Asia, and they are actually, we had toured a manufacturing facility where they make jet bridges for airplanes. So I'm sure you know, many of you have probably flown on, on airplanes and so on, and when you walk from the terminal to the plane, there's always that sort of that corridor. And there are actually a couple companies in the US that make those and supply them to much of the world. And so there's this company called JBT Aerotech uh, outside of Salt Lake City, and they make those and they export them and they make you know, quite a bit of money exporting them to different countries. The reason why this delegation was there is because in all of these countries in, in Asia where they were representing, they're building new airports or they're renovating their airports and they're going to need that equipment. And so we wanted to make sure as an agency that these government officials, these decision makers, that they knew uh, that the United States could provide them with that technology. They got to kind of walk out and, and see the sort of test areas and see the sort of high tech versions. Uh, and, and so that really helped this company, JVT Aerotech. I don't actually know what, you know, if they sold any immediately following this or not, but it helped them position themselves for future growth. And they didn't have to travel to, I think these guys were from, I'm trying to remember, uh, Myanmar, remember these guys from Myanmar, have some people from sort of other parts of Southeast Asia as well. So that was pretty neat. So I got to kind of go around with them. I got to kind of be responsible for them for that day, for the delegation, make sure they had what they needed. That was a pretty neat project to work on. This last one, this is kind of a fun picture. So that arrow is pointing to me, like all the heads in there are really small. But this is actually in Serbia, uh, where I went with the delegation on a trade mission to Belgrade in 2018, actually. And this is a press event with a, a Serbian sort of business group, like a chamber of commerce, just like they have here in Joplin. Uh, and they were talking about the fact that there was a U.S. delegation of companies there looking to meet with Serbian companies, the importance of trade between the U.S. and Serbia. And, and it was a pretty big deal. I mean, it was on, I don't remember if it was on the national news, but it's definitely on the local news. Uh, and so I got to be a part of that. I got to help organize that program for months in advance. I got to talk with the U.S. companies who were traveling. I want to say maybe 10 or 15 who were in that group. And then I got to travel with them. I got to accompany them with different meetings. We went to an event at the U.S. Embassy with the ambassador and so on. Uh, so that was a pretty neat project. And I've done a few of those kind of in different parts of the world. And this is all, so I was first based in Richmond, Virginia with this agency, and now in Kansas City. So this is all, I'm, I'm not living overseas. I'm, I'm based in the U.S., but I get to work on these kind of really interesting projects uh that that culminate in me kind of having a key role in their implementation so just a couple more slides here kind of wrapping up but another part of our organization has anyone here heard of, heard of the foreign service like diplomats overseas okay uh so when you travel to another country you know you're probably familiar with the fact that if you have a problem or uh maybe you know of someone who's looking to come to the us and they need a visa you, you might go to an embassy to kind of support one of those needs, a U.S. embassy or a consulate. But as I mentioned before, with regard to the Czech Republic, the, many of those embassies and consulates, especially where the U.S. has a large trading 
relationship, they have a commercial section. And so you can actually work in that role. We're always, always, each year, we're probably bringing on, I don't know, anywhere between like five and 15 foreign service officers to work for the Commerce Department. And, and they live around the world. So my colleague in this picture, Herb, she's here because she was joining me on one of these presentations. This is in South Africa, my colleague Rhonda. Uh, but you have individuals that live, you know, they live somewhere for two to four years. Uh, you don't pick your first assignment. Your first assignment is it's called the directed assignment. They tell you, okay, well, you need to go live in China or you need to go live in uh, India, places where we have kind of bigger presences typically uh, as a junior officer. But then you progress and then you can actually kind of bid or pick where your assignment will be. So if you really want to live in Latin America, you really want to live in Asia or Eastern Europe, you can sort of become an expert in that market and kind of move around to different countries. They provide language training. Uh, that's part of your job. You have to be proficient in the language depending upon where you're going, but they provide that to you. I mean, it's paid. Uh, it's a pretty interesting career. A lot of my colleagues have, have done it. Uh, that's something else that we're always looking. There's a lot of information online about it. You can see here, you don't actually have to have a master's degree to do that. You can have a, a bachelor's degree and just you do have to have some on the job experience though. So. That was kind of, that was pretty much it. Here's the contact info, my information. I've got the contact information for Olivia on there as well. Uh, really kind of just looking to talk with you all, see what questions you have about this work. If you're here, I'm guessing you're at least somewhat interested in international work, an international career. Uh, but yeah, we're welcome to take any questions or thoughts that you have. Who wants to go first? Anyone? Ken, you want to start off us off with a question? I have a couple. Okay. You had mentioned you work a lot with small businesses. <clears throat> so, what is a small business? Like, what does your agency consider? Yeah, good small question. Business? So, when we say small business, I mean there's really it runs a gamut. It's there's typically so the Small Business Administration has certain categories that it uses for different ways to decide if a company qualifies as a small business. I think they're like really roughly speaking, if it's a manufacturing company, it's usually 500 employees or less. Uh, that so, but many of the companies that we're working with, let's say in Kansas City, they don't have 500 employees. They might have more than, or more like 10 or 20 or 50. I've worked with companies that are more like startups, but they have a really unique product or service that sort of just lends itself to exporting and they can be successful. But it really runs the game, but it's 500 or less is, I believe, the typical definition. Yeah. So as a small business, you're thinking about exporting. You're seeing a lot of businesses that will export to, to Canada or Mexico, and, and so it's kind of a crowded market, maybe. Would the Czech Republic be an, a target for an experienced business? So that's a good question, Ken. I mean, it really is just going to depend. And unfortunately, there's a lot of research we can do. I would say sort of on average, sort of the average, let's say American company, you know, you may recall that slide where I talked about the Czech Republic being, I think, the 50th largest export definition or uh, destination for the US. There are probably other markets that might be sort of better next steps uh, as someone, as a company that's newer to export. Uh, there is a lot of market research that can inform that decision. But one way that companies sometimes will look at is, well, where is it easier to do business? Where does the US already have a lot of trading relationships? Where do we have free trade agreements? Uh, sometimes that can make it easier both on the front end, if there are certain requirements you need to meet as a foreign company, those are spelled out clearly and they're known. Uh, also, if you have a problem while you're doing business there, you have to, you would hope that there is a strong sort of mechanism in place for resolving that problem. And, and sometimes that doesn't exist if the US doesn't already have that strong relationship. So there are other markets. Uh, let's say you're already exporting to Mexico. That's definitely a, a, often a first market for companies looking to expand into Latin America. Uh, so if you're already exporting to Mexico, we probably would look at other markets in that region. Same with Europe. If you're already exporting to Europe, uh, if you can get into one market in Europe, depending upon your product, that can often help you really expand regionally as well. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So what would you say your favorite part of working with like small businesses would be? 
Uh, so I like, I enjoy doing factory tours. So I've done quite a few of those. Uh, you just kind of get to learn about all different goods and services. Like you just get to walk around and see. I'm trying to think of where, like some that I've been to recently. I went to a place in uh, Wichita. I was there for a meeting, but then there was a company there that actually exports quite a bit of uh, like a lot of lubricants. So like kind of automotive related products around the world. And so they had their, they had these, all these vehicles that they were using to test their products at a really high tech lab to test the purity of their oil. I mean, it was like so precise that like they were using all these lasers and, and advanced computer programs so that they could demonstrate to their customers why their product was better than, I don't know, Penn's oil or something, some other, or typically they're comparing with like foreign oils. But that company's making millions of dollars a year charging a premium for their products and you get to see how they do it. Like, so that's really interesting. And, and companies are really proud of that. They want to show you. They want to show you why their product is the best. And so I just, I kind of feed off that energy a little bit. And it helps me become excited about the work. Yeah, Lisa. So if you called upon any one of us here and said, help me find a small business that might be able to export what are things we would look for in that small business that we may know or may have a family member or friend that owns? What are things that we would look for that would be key triggers um, to express to you that they might be ready to export? That's a good question. There's actually, I'm not going to try to go to it right now, but there is a questionnaire on our website that companies can fill out and it'll kind of address, okay, well, do you do this or that? And if you, depending upon your answer, it'll tell them, well, you may be ready to export or not, but a lot of the sort of calculus behind that and the thinking has to do with uh, a few different items. So one would be their sort of domestic business. Are they successful domestically? Can they demonstrate that they're successful domestically? One differentiator to sort of allow us equal for international sales is that it does take a bit longer to get that first sale, to develop their relationship. Uh, just, just objectively speaking, it, it may take longer to accomplish that. So it has to be a company that is successful enough in the US that they can kind of wait out a little bit those first international sales. Uh, so that's part of it. They also have to have uh, capacity to expand. If you're talking about a manufactured good, if they're already fully kind of tapped out on their manufacturing, selling to the existing customers, they need to be able to respond if, because you're, you're, you're planning that they're gonna be successful. So that they get a big order from a new overseas customer, they have to be able to fill that order. Uh, so that's a question you kind of ask, well, what kind of capacity are you at now for your operations? Or if it's a service company, do you have enough employees to provide services or expertise uh, if you get an order, if you get a request, if you get a contract? So it's actually so much, I didn't talk about this, but so much of the U.S. exports are in services. And a lot of that is in consulting and engineering, architecture. Even in Kansas City, there's a very large uh, sort of architecture and design cluster. And those companies are selling all over the world. Even within that, there's a sports stadium design cluster in Kansas City. They're designing the guy, this one person, he designed the, uh, the, Las, the Las Vegas Raiders stadium. Uh, so the new Tennessee Titans one, he's doing that. And these are, you know, these are multi-billion dollar projects. So if that person, they, they need to be, read, that, that's kind of like an extreme example, but if it's a consulting company, they need to have enough consultants to, to do the work. And then maybe I'd say the last piece, this has to do with, with capital and financing. They have to make sure that they are, are sufficiently equipped. This kind of goes to my first point to, to sort of go without revenue or go without sales at first. But, but, but I would say all together, and maybe, maybe this is just, I'll add one more thing. It has to be compelling. They have to have a unique value proposition. It has to be something now that if a foreign customer is looking for a, uh, let's see here, I'm always looking around the room for like examples. If they're looking for a really fancy remote control, I know that's a bad example, but let's say, okay, well, I can get remote controls anywhere. I'm going to Google and I'm going to find, oh, wait a second, here's this company in Joplin. Look at their remote control. It's totally different. They do something that no one else is doing. I want to buy from them. You have to be able to make it compelling for a foreign customer to go through the extra trouble to buy from you. And so usually that means you have to have a really compelling product. We're not usually competing on price. U.S. goods are not usually going to be the lowest cost good. That's not somewhere where we excel. 
is usually on quality or it's on innovation. So if they have an innovative product or one like that motor oil company that really emphasizes quality and they can demonstrate it, then they can be successful. But that, that sort of underlines everything. You have to have the demand there. Yes. Based on your experiences, what are some of the most difficult countries to export to, maybe in terms of tariffs, regulations, you know, lack of a free trade agreement? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I don't want to speak sort of in broad kind of strokes, but, but often you may see some challenges with certain countries like a Brazil, like in India, uh, where they have a lot of, you know, we have it too in the United States, but they're known as maybe having a bit more red tape, a bit less transparency in terms of what you need to do to get into that country. A lot of the time they may have a, a local content requirement where you have to have a certain local partner to be able to sell there. You can't do it directly. The same is true in, in parts of the Middle East. Uh, like if you, I believe if you want to set up business in Saudi Arabia, you have to have a Saudi partner uh, and they have to be approved by certain groups. So those are just sort of from like an administrative standpoint. Of course, there are challenges exporting places where they don't have very robust infrastructure. You may not know that your goods are going to get to the final destination. Uh, if you're selling to rural or undeveloped parts of sub-Saharan Africa, or even, you know, even in, I mentioned Brazil, they have some challenges with some of their roads and their ports. Uh, I don't want to say categorically, but that can also be a challenge. Can your goods get to the final destination? And, and, and often infrastructure is a part of that. So I'd say, yeah, administrative work and I would say physical infrastructure are, are two of the biggest barriers often. And, and aside from Mexico and Canada, what are some of the easiest countries to export to? So that's also a good uh, good question. It, it depends a bit on your service. So you're, you're looking for commonalities, right, with the U.S. If you've been successful here, where else is kind of similar in some ways? Of course, uh, other Anglophone countries have a leg up. Their culture is a bit more similar to ours. We speak the same language. Uh, the other challenge, though, is often those are very developed and sophisticated markets. They have a lot of competition. So you have to look at that. I don't know that there's really one kind of easy or, or obvious first market for the U.S., especially once you start getting outside of North America for a U.S. company. But and you're also looking at rule of law and ability, like I mentioned before, ability to enforce. So if you have somewhere, as long as you have a competitive product, if you have somewhere that has a legal system that we can sort of work with and a payment and financial system that we can be successful with, that that's going to help. So you're talking about Europe. You're talking about uh, Australia, New Zealand, you're talking about a few other a few other markets. The thing is, a lot of companies now, especially those that are already being successful exporting, they're already selling those markets. And so then you need to, then they look now, that's why we have an emphasis on the developing world. A lot of our, our, our programs and our resources recently have been focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and the Indo-Pacific, because that's where the population growth is. That's where the sort of new money is developing. Other questions? No. Yes, Lisa. So, okay. from a student perspective, what would you encourage these students to do as part of their education here if they would want to potentially pursue a job like yours or another job within federal or state government involving trade? That's a really good question. And I wish I would have told you to ask that in advance because it's really, it's really nice. <laughs> but, uh, so we have internships. I mentioned I did an internship in Mexico. We have internships in the US too. So our office in Kansas City, we don't have one right now, uh, but we'll have often have an intern or two helping us with market research, helping us sort of joining us for meetings. And now again, we can do them virtually, uh, helping us develop marketing materials. Uh, but, uh, but so that's a really good way is just that sort of on the job training. The other, I don't know, does Missouri Economic Development have interns? Do you know, Olivia? Uh, we do have a few. Huh? Uh, a couple of the ones we have are actually from uh, international students. Okay. Um, but there are a few. So you, you look at other, you, you, of course, you can look at the organization that I'm from, and we do have opportunities, but also look at other organizations that do things that are similar. So state governments, local governments, or chambers. Can you get experience doing, you know, bringing people together? being uh, sort of communicating clearly 
Can you get experience that demonstrates that? Doing research, working with spreadsheets and databases. I don't want to say that for our day to day, the average person is just getting too heavy into the data analysis, uh, but it's useful to at least understand what you're looking at. So getting those kinds of experiences your, cl your classroom experiences are, even if you maybe don't have the time or uh, ability to take an internship, if you, if you go about your classroom experiences in a way and you think about them in a way that allows you to really show what you did and to capture your results, uh, that can be pretty meaningful for just getting that first job. Uh, your first job may not be, like, even if it's not in our organization, we, have, we, do, we do hire, but we have limited vacancies just like anyone. Uh, if it's in a related organization, that's often what people will do. They'll go work for, uh, or you can work for a private company if it's big enough. We have international sales. Uh, I know there's Ligon and Platt here. I know there are others that are kind of engaged internationally. Uh, uh, Cardinal Scale, for example. If you can get an internship at a place like that, that's really valuable experience too. But yeah, reach out to me. You know, we can talk more. I'm happy to share other ideas. Thank you, Lisa, for the question. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, content information, yeah, sure, we can do that. I'll just go back here. And I'm on LinkedIn, and you all can, I don't know if you all do LinkedIn, but that's actually uh, a lot of people in, at least in my field or in our field, they are putting their information on LinkedIn, they're talking about what they're doing. Uh, that can be a pretty good resource for you to make sure you have a good profile, and you don't have to have anything to set that up. But reach out to me on there, send me an email, uh, I can hang around a little bit after, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed working in this field. I'm glad I got to learn a little bit more about the Czech Republic through this presentation. And I just, I just appreciate the time and, and the invitation. Thanks everyone. Real quick before everyone leaves. So, um, importance of his organization. So there's a small business owner not in Missouri, somewhere else, who went on a foreign trade uh, trade ship. So he goes off by himself representing his company. His company did specialized mobile, like like ambulances, and they transport parts and th things like that, that kind, of a, that kind of an industry. He goes overseas. He gets wine and dine by this distributor. He signs a distribute, an exclusive deal with this one company finds out that this guy's brother needs two of these, but he buys them at cost. And then he's locked in, he's never gonna sell another thing in this country. And had he spoken to or reached out to partners within the state or wherever he was from, he could have avoided this huge mistake because that was a market that he could have sold 50 to 100, let's say there were ambulances, and now he sold two and he's done. So, and it's exclusive, it's hand to pie. So that's the importance of what these organizations and entities can do. So thank you for being here today. Please accept a gift thank you. on behalf of the School of Business. If you didn't get a chance to sign in, this program is helped funded by the Small Business Administration <coughs> and as part of the funding requirements, attendees who attend programs like this, please have you sign in, scan in, something like that before you leave. You We've already done that, we say thank you. And you'll have a really brief survey sent to you probably tomorrow. But with that, thank you so much and uh, go export. Do great things. Thanks again.